Hello my loves and welcome back to yet another episode of Strange Playgrounds. Now those of you who have been keeping tabs on Netflix of late will notice that certainly on the UK site recently there's been a uh, sort of an influx of new material certainly uh, with regards to horror. Um, one of the films that has recently been uploaded to Netflix is uh, one of my favourites of recent years which is uh, The Ritual uh, based on the book by Adam Neville. This the ritual was really interesting to me because it came out. It was in cinemas at the same time as the the first half of the new adaptation of it, Stephen King's it. So it was really interesting. It was sort of it's the kind of film that sort of derived from the same tradition as the likes of um, the Descent, uh, the Babadook. Uh, later the witch that kind of thing sort of the very clever cerebral uh, s sort of small uh, small studio almost independent horror uh, s certainly small budget horror that has more in the way of creative freedom than many of the bigger budgeted films do because there's just not as much in the way of inv of investment in them it does allow, this seems to be the case for horror in general actually, certainly in cinema and certainly in film. Um, for the most part, the horror films that are most significant, the ones that really change everything, the way that horror is preconceived and assumed to be by its audiences, certainly in the mainstream, tends to be very small budget. It tends to be either independent or semi-independent, or it comes from a very small studio indeed. Um, I think of sort of the raft of very significant horror films that came out in the wake of certain cultural events in the US. So sort of like from the late 1960s right up to the 1990s really, you had this eruption of very clever semi-independent horror which then informed the way that studios and big budgets, uh, big budgeted operations made horror films. So you had the likes of Night of the Living Dead, you had Last House on the Left, you had um, The Evil Dead, you had Hellraiser, uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. You know, relatively small budget works, but which changed the way cinema is made. It changed the way people make horror films. Um, and it's interesting because at that in that period, ho mainstream horror was very clever. It was very interesting, very engaging. It was aesthetically deviant. It was of, of often morally and philosophically very deviant. I mean, if you look at things like The Last House on the Left, for example, the original one, which is, I mean, when people ask me, what's your favorite Vietnam film, for example, most people expect you to say something like Full Metal Jacket or Apocalypse Now. I often say Last House on the Left because Last House on the Left is is so, so much a Vietnam film. It's It, it captures the, the sense of moral nihilism that the US found itself in, certainly that US youth culture found itself in, in the wake of Vietnam, when it became very apparent that the US government was lying to its people, that it was uh, sending people to die in a pointless, hideous hideous war and then just throwing them away after you know and also that the u.s soldiers were committing atrocities uh, in vietnam that were then filtering into uh popular media if you look if you watch the original last house on the left and by the way if you do be careful of it it's a horrible film it's a genuinely dirty grimy violent nihilistic film that that captures so much about where the u.s found itself at that point it's basically a death of the american dream film uh, but if you watch it very carefully you'll notice that um wes craven recreates those photographs and images that found themselves in the news media regarding Vietnam and the atrocities that uh, US soldiers were committing over there. Um, he actually recreates some of the shots and some of the atrocities themselves in the film. It's very much a Vietnam film. And that's what you get in this period from mainstream US horror, sort of Hollywood horror. You actually get horror that is socially reflexive, that is culturally resonant, that is politically very deviant indeed. And that lasts right up until the mid-1990s when it becomes more crystallized and commercial and all you really get then is um, you get horror that's not horror. What you get then are just endless sequels and remakes and studios deciding what they think horror is rather than referring to culture to determine what it is and allowing people to create the kind of horror that they want to create um but the it's not until very very recently that horror has kind of recovered 
from that era. It's it's taken such a long time. It, there were, there's been the odd gem it released into the mainstream or that's managed to claw its way into some sort of popular limelight. Um, but they're very few and far between. Very few and far between. Um, the real revolution in horror is happening as it once did in on the small on the lower level sort of small budget um but the ritual is an example of how that can make good basically it's a horror film that is highly cerebral massively ambiguous um densely psychological it's one of those films very much like the descent very much like the babadook where it becomes apparent that you may not be seeing what you think you're seeing that you're you're you are perceiving reality through the eyes of characters who are for whatever reason highly disturbed who have issues who are trying to work them out and once again like in the descent you get a wilderness it's really interesting this 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 happens quite a lot actually you often get in these kinds of psychological um almost Jungian explorations of the of the inner mind where the where it's difficult to discern between what's happening inside a diseased mind and what is projected from it and what is external and objective. You often get these um, wanderings into a wilderness, be it, uh, you know, the caves in the descent, or whether it's a, a desert, or whether it's an ashen wasteland, or whether it's this. And in this instance, it's it's forest land and mountain land. Um, it's the nowhere spaces that traditionally were populated with the every fantastical, monstrous, and demonic creature that humanity could imagine, and project its collective issues and neuroses and fears onto that's kind of what this is it's a postmodern version of the old stories that were told around campfires once upon a time it's that kind of story it's very clever in that regard but it it mingles with that postmodern psychology so you get like freudian and jungian references thrown in as well as lots of other stuff uh a lot of it isn't explained in those terms it's it's aesthetic it's symbolic so you need to watch and you need to understand you need to be in a particular frame of mind where you are you are capable of interpreting images as though they are paintings as though they are metaphors and it works very well on that level it works very very well very different from the book I will say the book it is worth reading the book first not because one particular story is better than the other but because the film deviates fairly largely from the book at a particular point the beginnings are the same but when when things start to really go to hell as inevitably they do then the the book and the film diverge enormously they both still have this very peculiar psychological resonance to them, but they explore it in very different ways. I would say that the book is probably more ambiguous than the film is, um, and the book shows you and explains less than the film does. The film has a lot more that's visual that's happening, um, and that's actually to its strength, because of course film is a visual medium. Um, and yes, there there are proje projection. What could be projections of fantastical creatures, monsters, and so on and so forth, or could actually literally be creatures and monsters and so on and so forth. It's very, 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 very difficult to tell. And this ambiguity is the film's strength. It really is. It has this wonderful, dark, desolate barren feeling to it in the same way that the descent does it feels it has this kind of this cold cruelty to it where you know it's going to get dark you know it's going to be horrible you know these characters are not going to have a good time and there's likely not going to be a great deal of salvation in it it's that kind of story there is grit there is grime there is a kind of spiritual dirt to the film which i really enjoy i've got to say and the book has that too but it the book boils it down to a much more human level i would say and the book is a is a little bit more ambiguous in the sense that it the book actually maintains this notion of 
is it happening? Is it not happening? Is it literal? Is it internal? Is it metaphorical? It's very hard to say. Whereas the film seems to come down on a particular side at the end, although you could question that. You could certainly question that. There is this wonderful nightmare logic to everything that happens in both stories. Um, the whole the film has this feeling of wandering through a very primal nightmare scape. It's the it's the it's the wild wood. It's the deep dark wood where the big bad wolf lurks it's it's the place where the fairies live and where you don't go after sundown that's the the fundamental fear that this film is tapping into and in that regard the horror element of it it does have this very primal almost childlike element it's what a child would be afraid of but which we often as adults are not but which in this context is very scary is very frightening and demonstrates just how our delusions of control over the landscape and over reality are exactly that. They are delusions. You know, it doesn't take much for a very postmodern human being to get lost and possibly lethally so to find themselves in situations where they could freeze to death, where they could starve to death, where they could be attacked by predators, where they could wander around lost forever and ever until they eventually starve or die of thirst, you know, or exposure. That's kind of the fear that this film taps into. It is, it, it reawakens the fear of the wilderness but it's not just an external wilderness it's an internal wilderness as well it's the wilderness of one's own psyche which is as the film seems to state as powerfully frightening and unpredictable as anything that might be out there perhaps even more so because it's a, it's a wilderness you can never navigate it's a wilderness you can never escape from because it is yours it's yours fundamentally and I really like that. I mean, it's it's one of those films where people react to it in different, very, very different ways, depending on what they want from it. I think people who've read the book and who love the book kind of find the film difficult because the film is so starkly removed in terms of where it ultimately comes down and the explanations it provides, or rather the lack of explanations it provides, than the, um, than the book itself. So... You really do need to experience both of them, and it depends on what you want as to which one you experience first. They are both very... They're so starkly removed from one another. Um, and for me, that's probably a good thing. That's probably a good thing. What the what the film adaptation does is it takes the essential book of the ritual, the essential elements, the themes, the characters, the setting, and it explores them in very different ways. It explores different emphases and different significances of the situation and the environment and the characters it's quite clever in that regard and it makes it more filmic it makes it more cinematic it makes it more overtly visual um and that works very very much in its favor it really does it was wonderful seeing the film alongside the the new adaptation of it at the cinema because I, it'd been a long time when I went to see both of them before since I'd gone to see a horror film at the cinema I, I most mainstream horror that's released at the cinema I really don't like stuff like as we've explored before on this channel the conjuring that kind of crap hate it I hate it I cannot stand it it is boring it is paint by numbers horror and I cannot abide it seeing this and it at the cinema was wonderful because it is in many respects it is the the total contrast to this film it's a big budget massive studio produced film based on a, a a book that has been enshrined in the horror canon for decades that is i mean everybody knows it everybody knows pennywise the clown even people who have never read a, a single stephen king story know it and pennywise the clown so you had the, the sort of the popcorn horror the the big sort of 1980s technicolor bravura horror of Stephen King's It contrasted to this very downbeat, dark and dirty, highly cerebral, metaphorical horror, which is based on um, a small press book, you know. Um, it's very cool to have those two together at the cinema and to have both of them do well. Being Having the option of going to see both of them is absolutely wonderful. And that seems to be the very slow-burning trend at the moment. As much as I enjoyed The Ritual as a film, and I really did, um, I think it's a very worthy piece of work. Um, um, what I like more 
What I enjoy more about it is what it signifies, alongside the likes of the Babadook and whatnot, and later on the Witch and Hereditary, is this escalation in clever, witty, uh, cerebral, transgressive horror which has been in absentia for far too long. And the fact that it's at mainstream cinemas, it's reaching mainstream audiences, is wonderful to me. It really is. Now, you could sit and pick the film apart all day. Is it perfect? No, not by any means. Does it have flaws? Yes, it's perhaps a little too overlong. Um, some of the... Some elements are maybe a bit too visual. Maybe it ex tries to explain a bit too much in contrast to the book. Maybe so. But that to me doesn't necessarily matter i like the fact that it's here i like the fact that it exists that it it garnered some degree of high profile i really like that and that it managed to hold its own against the likes of stephen king's it you know because of course it was always going to have the big studios behind it it was always going to have the budget it was always going to have the advertising so any horror film that was standing up against it in the cinema was almost doomed to failure and it didn't fail it did rather well by all accounts. So that's wonderful. That to me suggests that no matter how the the powers that be have tried to insist that it's otherwise, there's an appetite out there for this kind of horror. For the horror that isn't paint by numbers, that isn't just another slasher film, that isn't just a, a remake of a remake of a reboot of a sequel to an established franchise, that is something new, something witty, something deviant. I think it's out there. I really do. I think the appetite is just bursting at the seams because it's been so... We are starved for it at the moment. So it's wonderful to see something like the ritual out there um go forth and watch it i i cannot recommend this enough it is now available on netflix so go forth and watch it is very very worthy indeed um and then go and read the book or read the book and then watch the film it's an interesting experience because they are so different because they're such different animals go forth and watch and enjoy until next time ladies and gents bye bye <laughs> Ha 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 